Good day, grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in mathematics. In this lesson, we're going to be revising paper one. Now, I know that the majority of students have finished writing the exams, but if you're in the IEB, you haven't, and you'll be writing maths paper one tomorrow, which is why we're going to be going through continue to go through a prelim paper for maths paper one. So um, I we got as far as this question. Yeah, we need to do question 6.2.3. We were busy working with finance. We had Nicholas who was planning to buy a car, advertised at 210,000 Rand. He paid a 10% deposit and then so on and so on. Now it says um, Nicholas after two years, he changes to a different job and his salary increases. He is now able to increase his monthly payments to 5,500 per month. Given that the balance of his debt on that stage at this stage is 144,661 rand and 94 cents, how many payments will he still need to make to settle the loan? Okay, so let's think about this. First of all, we need to know that he's now his monthly payments. So X is 5,500. The amount that he has to pay, the amount, is 144,661 and 94 cents. And they want to know what N is. They want to know the number of payments. The interest rate was still 0, 0,16 over 12 because it was compounded monthly. Now the next thing we need to work out is if we're going to be using a future value or a um, present value formula and what you will think about is the fact that he already has the loan and he's paying it back therefore we are using the present value formula so what we are going to do is we're going to say 144 661 rand and 94 cents is equal to but what's different now is before we're working out how much he was paying back and before he was paying back um, 4,000 about 4,000 now he's paying back 5,500. So it's 1 minus 1 plus 0, 0,16 over 12, that's the interest, to the power of negative n, okay, all over 0, 0,16 over 12, that's your i. And now we need to work out that n. So the first thing we're going to do, I would say, is we're going to multiply this side, or both sides, by 0 0.16 over 12, and divide by 5,500 so we can get this by itself. So let's do that. We're going to go 144661,94. We're going to multiply by 0 0,16 over 12, and divide by 5,500. And that is going to get us 1 minus 1 plus 0, 0,16 over 12 to the power of negative n. Okay, so then what we need to do is we need to put that in a calculator. So let's do that straight away. So let's do that. So we go, let's put it on. 144 and then it's 661.94. Times, oh, so sorry about that. That's not supposed to happen. Um, times a fraction, really, of naught uh, one six all over all over twelve equals and then we divide it by five five zero zero equals and that's naught point three five let's go as far as 0.35 so therefore that's naught comma three five equals one minus one plus naught comma one mm, 
Okay, let's just work out what that is in the brackets, shall we? Let's just put that in, work that out. Okay, so that is, and let's just change color again. Okay, so this becomes one plus the fraction of 0 0.16 all over 12 equals 1.01. Okay, so this is 1 comma 0, 1 all to the power of negative n. It makes life a little bit easier. So now what we're going to do is we're going to subtract 1 from both sides so we get rid of this one. Okay, so it becomes 0 comma 3, 5 minus 1 is equal to minus this 1 comma 0, 1 to the power of negative n. Okay, so this becomes negative 0 comma 6, 5 is negative 1 comma 0 1 to the power of negative n. Now I know I'm doing this slowly and the reason I'm doing it slowly is because I find a lot of times my students make silly mistakes when they use their calculators and even though they've got all the marks for substituting beautifully into the formula, suddenly when it comes to actually working it out there's a problem. So now we've got, let me write it out, 0 comma 6 5 is equal to 1 comma 0 1 all to the power of negative n. And now the base way to do this is to log it, but if you guys struggle with logging, we can log both sides. Okay, so let's do that. We can log 0 comma 6 5 is equal to log 1 comma 0 1 to the power of negative n. Now the reason logging makes it a bit easier is because if you then know that the only rule you need to know is that minus n needs to go to the front. So therefore we've got log of 0 comma 6 5 is equal to minus log minus n times 1 comma 0 1 and then it's actually really easy because we're just going to divide the logs and we'll end up with negative n and then we can work out what n is. Okay, I'm just going to raise this because I need the space. And then I'm going to change colors so you can see where I'm going with this. So I'm going to go log of 0, 0,65 divided by the log of 1 comma 0 1 is equal to negative n. So now all we need to do is get out our calculator and clear it and we go log of 0 0.65 bracket divided by log of 1 point, no let's try again, delete, 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 log of 1 point 0, 1, close bracket, equals, and that's minus 43.29, so that's minus 43,29, and then obviously that is equal to negative n, so n is going to be 43,29, but you can't have a comma 29 for your payments, so therefore it has to be 44 payments, because obviously if you pay 43 payments, you don't fulfill the obligation, so we need to make 44 payments, and there you go, done. Right, next question. Okay, so now we're moving, so basically I'm going through a whole exam paper, so now we are moving on to our calculus and our principles, uh, first principles of calculus. So the first thing you need to realize is that the formula is on your formula sheet, so you don't need to learn this. It's f of x, f dash of x is a limit as h tends to naught, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Okay, that's the first thing. Secondly, what I would suggest you do is we write out, we know what f of x is, let's make our lives a little bit easier by writing out what f of x plus h is before we start writing this out. So f of x plus h is equal to minus x plus h all cubed. Okay, that's what that is, minus x plus h all cubed, which is going to be minus and then let's work it out. So 
I'm going to do it a little bit slowly just to help you. So the first two, so we could rewrite this, do you agree, as x plus h squared times x plus h, if some of you struggle with a cube and you don't know it. So it becomes x squared plus 2xh plus h squared multiplied by x plus h, okay, which becomes minus x squared times x is x cubed, x squared times h is plus x squared h, this times this is plus 2x squared h, this times this is plus 2xh squared, this times this is plus xh squared, and that times that is plus h cubed. So you end up with minus x cubed minus 3x squared h minus 3xh squared plus, oopsie, minus h cubed. And that is your f of x plus h. Now, it, we can easily do this question. So we say f dashed of x equals the limit as h tends to zero. And again, grade 12s, if you leave out this limit as h tends to zero, you are going to get it wrong. You have to write that in all the way to the point at which you drop the limit because you're using it, okay? So please remember to write it out. Now, f of x plus h is all of this. So it's minus x cubed minus 3x squared h minus 3xh squared minus h cubed, okay, minus bracket minus x cubed. Please remember your brackets, otherwise you're going to get this wrong. All of h. Okay, so that becomes the limit as h tends to zero. So do you agree that this minus x cubed cancels with this because this becomes minus times a minus is a plus. So this cancels with this. And we're left with minus three x squared h minus three x h squared minus h cubed all of h. So do you agree we can take out a common factor of h? So let's do that. So it becomes the limit, notice I'm still writing it as h tends to zero, of let's take out an h, and we're left with minus 3x squared, minus 3xh, minus h, all over h. The h's cancel, and now we're going to use our limit. We're going to say, right, what does this become if h tends to zero. In other words, what's going to happen if h gets so small that effectively it is zero? What we can do is then this is going to go away because 3x times zero is just zero and this is zero. So we're left with minus 3x squared and that is our final answer. Right, please guys be careful with this. It's an easy question. It's usually worth four or five marks, which is quite a nice size question but you do need to be careful not to make silly mistakes. Right, now that we've learned how to do it the hard way, let's now use our rules just to do this. It says, determine the derivative of the following, giving answers with positive exponents. Please be careful of that. If they say do it with positive exponents, don't go around given the answers of the negative exponents, it's silly. You're going to lose your marks. Okay, so let's rearrange this. This becomes f of x is equal to 3x cubed. Now we need to bring this up to the top in order to do the x squared, to order to be able to differentiate it. So it becomes minus 7 over 2 x to the negative 2 plus 4. Now we can use our rule f dashed of x, sorry, if f of x is equal to a x the n, then f dashed of x is a n x the n minus 1. You bring the n to the front and you subtract 1 from the exponent. So that becomes 3 multiplied by 3 x squared minus 7 over 2. We bring that to the front, it becomes minus 2 x to the minus 3 and this dude goes away. So that becomes 3 times 3 is 9 x squared 
the minus cancel, the minus becomes a plus. 2 cancels, the 2 and just becomes 7. X negative 3, but they said they want it in positive exponents, so therefore it becomes 9x squared plus 7 over x cubed, and that is your final answer. Okay, right, now let's do the next one. We've got f of x is 2 root x minus 1 over x squared. Now, first of all, we need to convert this dude here from a third to an exponent. Then what we need to do is square this thing out. Then we can differentiate. Okay, so do you agree this is the same as saying 2x to the half minus 1 over x all squared? Now we need to square it, okay? So if you struggle with this, there is nothing wrong with rewriting the bracket and then using foil. So it's 2x to the half minus 1 over x, right? And now we are going to use foil. Nothing wrong with that. So foil is first. 2 times 2 is 4. x to the half times x to the half, what do you do? You add the exponents. And a half plus a half is one. Then we multiply this with this. So it becomes two times x to the half. So, and this is minus, it's minus two x to the half times by x to the negative one, because that's effectively negative one, because it's underneath. Okay, one over x is the same as x to the negative one. Then we do this one, it becomes minus, same thing, 2x to the half times x to the negative 1. And then we multiply those ones the last, so it becomes minus, times minus is a plus, and we've got 1 over x squared. Do you agree? So then, if we rewrite this, we've got 4x minus, minus 2 minus 2 is minus 4, but now what is this? This is x to the half times by negative 1 becomes, remember you're adding it, so it is a half minus 1 is minus a half. So that's 4x to the negative a half, okay, remember you're adding the index exponents, plus x to the negative 2. Right, now, now, we can, now we can differentiate. So now we got f dashed of x is equal to four, okay? Minus four times by negative a half, okay? x to the minus a half minus one plus minus two x to the negative three. Okay, let me explain. This is minus a half goes to the front, becomes minus a half. Then you go minus a half minus one, and this is minus two goes to the front, and minus two minus one is minus three. So this becomes four, minus times a minus is a plus, two cancels with a four to become two, x to the negative three over two, okay, minus two x to the negative three, but remember they wanted positive exponents, so therefore that becomes 4 plus 2 over x to the 3 over 2 minus 2 over x cubed. There we go. Not too bad, hey? Not too bad at all. Right, let's do the next question. Aha, now it says g of x is equal to x cubed minus 2x squared plus 3x minus 1. So this is obviously a nice polynomial, and they are asking us some questions on it. First, it says determine the equation of tangent to g at x equals negative 1. So the most important thing to realize is that the formula for the equation of the tangent is a straight line, obviously y is equal to mx plus c. So we need a couple of things. The first thing we need is the gradient at x equals negative 1. And to get the gradient, we need to find g dash of x. So g dash of x is equal to 3x squared minus 4x 
plus 3. That is the equation of this gradient, of, I mean, of the gradient of this graph at every point on the graph. But now we want the gradient at x equals minus 1. So we're going to go g dashed of minus 1, which is 3 times minus 1 squared, minus 4 times minus 1, plus 3. So that becomes 3 minus times minus is plus 4, plus 3, which becomes 10. So that there is a gradient, that there is 10, okay? Now we need to find the y value at that point so that we can find the c. So what we're going to do is we're going to substitute minus 1 into the original to find the y value, okay? Because g of x is the y value. So we're going to go g of minus 1 is equal to minus 1 cubed minus 2 times minus 1 squared plus 3 times minus 1 minus 1, which is minus 1 cubed is minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 minus 1, which is negative 7. Sorry, yeah. Am I right? Minus 1 cubed is minus 1, minus 2, yes, that's negative 7. So therefore we can say that we have y equals 10x plus c, but we have the point minus 1, minus 7 going through it, right? So do you agree that therefore I can say that minus 7 equals 10 times minus 1 plus C? So C is going to be minus 7 plus 10. So C is going to be 3. Therefore, the equation of the tangent at G equals negative 1 is going to be Y is equal to 10X plus 3. Awesome. Okay, now the next part of the question says, determine the values for x for which g of x is concave up. Concave up. Okay, so let's think about that. For g of x to be concave up, do you agree that our gradient has to be what? Our gradient has to be positive. Okay, so the way to do this is we've got g dashed of x, which is 3x squared minus 4x plus 3. To find out where this graph is concave up, we need to find the second derivative and find out where it is greater than 0. Okay, so we're going to find g dashed of x. g dashed of x is going to be 6x minus 4. Now that is the gradient of the gradient. And when that is greater than 0, the graph is concave up. So that means that it's going to be 6x must be greater than 4. Therefore, x must be greater than 2 over 3. Right, happy with that. Good, next. Now, Oh, got very nice questions in this paper. It says the graphs of f of x equals minus x cubed plus 3x plus 2. So I immediately know that that's 2. And minus x plus 2, so that's also 2, are drawn below. The graphs intersect at p and q. R is a turning point, And f of x has intersects at q and at minus 1, 0. First of all, it says determine the coordinates of Q. Okay, well, Q is obviously 2, 0, or sorry, um, yeah, 2, 0. And the reason I know that is because H of X is minus X plus 2. So since the gradient is 1 to 1, and since it is going through here at 2, this gradient has to be 2, 0. So this is 2, 0. Okay, so that's nice and easy, right? Now it says determine the coordinates of R. R is a turning point of the polynomial minus x cubed plus 3x plus 2. So in order to find the turning point, I need to find the first derivative because the gradient at that point is 0. Okay, so we're going to go f dashed of x 
is equal to minus 3x squared plus 3. Okay. And to find a local maximum, we're going to let it equal 0. So we've got minus 3x squared plus 3 equals 0. Let's divide everything by minus 3. So minus 3, we've got x squared minus 1 equals 0. So therefore, we've got x minus 1, x plus 1 equals 0. Therefore, x equals 1 or x equals minus 1. But that's perfect because we know that this bit here, this turning point is minus 1, 0. So therefore, this must be 1 something. So what are we going to do? How do we find the y value? We're obviously going to substitute 1 back into this formula to find the y value here. So we're going to go f of 1 is going to be minus 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 plus 2, which is minus 1 plus 3 plus 2, which is 4. So therefore, this value there is 4. So this is 1, 4. Now it says, for which values of x is f dashed of x greater than 0? For which values of x is f dashed of x greater than than zero. Okay, so we want to find out when the gradient is positive. Okay, we want to find out where the gradient is positive. So it says determine the, okay, which now that, so what we need to do is find the second derivative. Okay, so we're going to go f double dashed of x is equal to, well, hang on, now I've just erased. Okay, so f dashed of x is minus 3x plus 3, right? So therefore, f double dashed of x is going to be minus 3. Um, what, that can't be right, minus 3x squared. Oh, there we go. So second derivative, it's a bit better. is going to be minus 6x. And then we let that equal 0 to find out where the turning point is, where the point of um, con the change of the concavity happens. So we let that equal 0 and we can see that x equals 0. So therefore, we can say that this is going to have a positive gradient, okay? Um, from minus 1, I'm just thinking if there's an easy way to, yeah, that's right, from, no, from minus 1 to 0. So for which values of x is this going to be greater than 0? For x is smaller than 0 and bigger than um, minus 1. Yeah, it's all negative. Yeah, it's all negative. Yeah, it's positive and yeah, it's changing. Okay, so the gradient is going to be positive from x is smaller than 0 and bigger than minus 1. Now it says determine the point at which the graph f of x plus 2 changes concavity. When does the graph of f of x plus 2 change its concavity. So now what we need to do is we need to take this graph, f of x, f of x, okay, and we need to, sorry, I'm thinking, I'm overthinking this. I'm just going to fix this. I'm overthinking it. I'm thinking about the point of, yeah, okay. Do you agree that all the way from here to here, the gradient is positive because it is sloping up to the right? So therefore, we can say x is smaller than 1 and greater than minus 1. I apologize for the previous one. I was more talking about the point at which the gradient changes from a turning up to turning down. But the actual gradient is still positive all the way from minus 1 to 1. Okay, now we need to talk about the second derivative. Okay, do you agree? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty
helpful, yeah. Do you agree that if double dashed of x, like we said, was minus 6x, okay? So we know that when is minus 6x equals naught, x has to equal naught, obviously. So the f double dashed of x is greater than naught when x is smaller than naught, and f double dashed of x is going to be smaller than naught So therefore, when does it change concavity? It changes concavity at this point here, which is x is naught, y is 2. Um, so basically, it would normally be, normally it would be at, do you agree that normally the point of concavity would be this point here where it changes, okay, the point of inflection, the point of inflection is normally at naught 2. But now what has this plus 2 done? It has moved the whole graph, graph up by two points. So therefore, for this answer here, the point of inflection is naught 4. There we go. Now it says give a reason why the concavity changes at that point. Well, obviously the reason the concavity changes at that point is because it's going from its sloping up and then it's sloping starting to slope down because it's changing direction um, and then obviously it's gone we moved the whole graph up by two which is why it's at that point finally it says for which values of x is f dashed of x smaller than zero and f double dashed of x greater than zero simultaneously so it's saying for which values of x I mean, just get a different color so I can think about this. Okay, so we know that f dashed of x is smaller than zero. The gradient is smaller than zero um, from here to here and from here to here. Do you agree? That's f dashed of x is smaller than zero. Then they also want f double dashed of x to be greater than zero. f double dashed of x to be greater than zero. So f double dashed of x is greater than zero all the way from there to there. So therefore it is only from here onwards. Okay, so therefore we can say that that is for x is greater than one. There we go, that's all it is. Right, let's move on to a nice question. This says, a cylinder with a radius of R fits neatly into a sphere with radius of 10 units, okay? So this here is a cylinder, it has a radius R, and it fits into the sphere with radius 10 units. And they tell you the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared height, which is quite nice. Okay. Now it says show the volume of the cylinder in terms of h is volume is 100 pi h minus 4 pi h cubed over 4. Okay. Right, so just a little word of advice. Even if you can't find this, you can still use this to do 9.2. So don't panic if you can't get this out. You can still use it to work out 9.2. But let's have a look at this, okay? Do you agree that this is the center of the circle? Okay. And this is the whole cylinder right so do you agree that this year would be the whole height and this would be half the height so we can say that this is half h okay so by pythagoras since we know that that's 90 degrees because this is obviously the height and this is the radius we can say a half h all squared plus r squared is equal to 10 squared by Pythagoras, right? 
Now that means that we can solve for r squared. And why do we want that? Because the volume is pi r squared h. And we want everything in terms of h. So we can say r squared is equal to 10 squared minus a quarter h squared, which is the same as 100 minus a quarter h squared, right? Now we can substitute into this formula. So we've got the volume is pi r squared h, which is pi h multiplied by 100 minus h squared over 4, just to make it look easier to work with, which is going to be 100 pi h minus pi h cubed over 4, because pi times the pi h times by this gives you pi h cubed over 4. Ta-da! Yay, we've got it. Okay, now it says calculate the height of the cylinder correct to two decimal places so that the volume is a maximum. Okay, so as soon as you see max and min, what do you do? You differentiate, let it equal zero and solve. So, they gave us this formula. And grade 12s, I have to stress this, that it doesn't matter if they give you a total different formula from what you work out you will use the formula that they gave you okay so they say v is a hundred pi h minus pi h cubed over four happily we worked that out as well that's cool but the point is that they gave that to us okay now we want a maximum so what do we need to do we need to go dv by dh which is going to be 100 pi minus, it's pi over 4 times by 3 pi h squared, okay? So that's 100 pi minus 3 pi over 4 h squared. I don't know why we wrote that. And that has to equal 0 for local maximum, okay, for the maximum. So then what we can do is we can say, well, that makes life a little bit easier. So we can say th minus 3 pi over 4 h squared is equal to a minus 100 pi, right? So therefore, the pi is cancel. That's quite nice. The minus is cancel. So we've got h squared is equal to 400 over 3. So h is going to be the square root of 400 over over 3 and they said to two decimal places so now we go square root now let's clear shall we square root of a fraction of 400 over 3 equals 11.547 but they said to two decimal places so it's 11.55 the height is 11 comma 55 and they always just check what they gave us and they only gave us units there's not like centimeters or meters or whatever so there you go and then you always go back and check did they ask us to calculate the height or the actual volume they said calculate the height so we finished the question awesome let's move on okay let's do this quickly it says R and Q are two events in the sample space. The probability of R is 0.4 and the probability of R or Q is 0.9 and the probability of Q is Y. Determine the value of Y if R and Q are mutually exclusive. Okay, if they are mutually exclusive and you are given this formula, then P of R or Q equals the P of R plus the P of Q, minus the P of R and Q, okay? So we know that if they're mutually exclusive, this is going away, they don't exist. So therefore we've just got nine, 0.9 is equal to 0.4 plus Y, therefore Y is 0.5, yay! So that's 0.5. Now it says, if they are independent, 
okay, if they're independent. Then, if they are independent, the probability of Q and R is equal to the probability of Q multiplied by the probability of R, okay? And therefore, we can say the probability of Q plus the probability of R minus the probability of Q or R equals the probability of Q and R, right? We're just rearranging this. So therefore, we've got both of this. You've got um, this bit here, which is Y plus 0, 4 minus 0, 9 is equal to Y times 0, 4, right? Therefore, we've got, if we add this up, we've got 0 0.6Y is equal to 0, 5. Therefore, Y is just going to be 5 over 6. Okay, right, unfortunately grade 12, that's as far as we can go for this lesson. Please go and practice, practice, practice. And then I really would suggest that you get an early night. It's very important that you get an early night because it's more important that you have a fresh brain for tomorrow's exam than anything else. Have a great day. Cheers.